All right, well, let's pick up with uh, part two of our conversation with uh, John J. Miller. Uh, you know, there's going to be a biography of you, John, in the uh, post of this, this video, the part. So we're not short scripting you by not uh, going over it uh, uh, at length or, or again. But uh, uh, in the biography is his authorship of A Gift of Freedom, uh, How the John M. Olin Foundation Changed America. So let's just start with this softball in part two. How, how did the John M. Olin Foundation change America? So the John M. Olin Foundation was this great conservative uh, philanthropy uh, started by John M. Olin, who was an American industrialist, who in the 1970s became concerned about free enterprise in the United States. He was worried that uh, the, 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 the most educated people often had, had lost faith in, in in institutions such as markets and private property and so forth. And, you know, we look, we look at America today with, uh, you know, a socialist running the, the budget committee in the, in, in, in the Senate, for instance. But um, Olin was worried about this way back in the 1970s. And, 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 and he was, he was this, this accomplished industrialist. He made a ton of money and he was near the end of his life. And he said, he said you know, I've, I have all this money it's now time, I've made all this money. It's now time for me to start giving it away. And I want to use the fortune that my father and I built because his father was very successful, but, but, but he had his own success and built upon what his father did. He said, I, I want to use this fortune that my father and I built to defend the principles that made our wealth possible. And so, 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 so he took the Olin Foundation, which he had, which he had started a, a, a earlier, but he said, he said, we're, we're now going to infuse it with cash and with this purpose and we're going to do this and so this was this is how he started out in the 1970s and he made a series of very smart hires where he had initially a guy called frank o'connell running it and then brought in uh bill simon who had been the the treasury secretary in the nixon administration among other things and a, a very um um uh, uh, successful uh, 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 investor and so forth, brought in Bill Simon to be the president of the organization. And then, and then later on, as, as Frank O'Connell moved on, he had Mike Joyce and Jim Pearson as outstanding executive directors. But the bottom line is John O'Mullen had this vision about what he wanted to do with his fortune. He made, uh, he was very clear about this. He, he hired some excellent people and, uh, and, and got the thing, you know, was up and running and, and, and giving grants and so forth and, and becoming a force in right of center philanthropy by the late 1970s. John Mullen died though in 1982. And the vast majority of his foundation's giving uh, took place after his death. And, um, you know, he, he had assembled a board of directors and, and, and told them, I, I would like you to, to, to spend out this endowment uh, within your lifetimes, and, and and what he basically was saying is, within a generation of my death, he did not he did not have a firm expiration date. But he said, within a generation of my death, I want you to spend all this money, and so you had a foundation that was never really more than about a hundred million dollars at its peak, was able to function as a kind of four hundred or five hundred million dollar foundation for a period of twenty or thirty years. And and become a, a major force. It is it is as as you, as you mentioned in the last show. It, it's it's now gone. It's it's depleted. The money is spent, and and its history could be written. And I I guess I am the one who did that. But um, um, that's that's essentially the story of the John M. Olin Foundation. When you think of um, uh, uh, elements of the conservative movement now, uh, the Federalist Society arguably would not exist today without the John M. Olin Foundation, the, the collegiate network and, 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 and college journalism, which we were talking about in the last episode, uh, would not exist without the John M. Olin Foundation. Uh, the, you know, the Heritage Foundation, it was not, Olin was not, a, um, um, you know, a, a, the, the first funder of the Heritage Foundation, but it was a very early partner of the Heritage Foundation. Again and again and again, you see you see the the, the fingerprints of the John M. Olin Foundation on, on on the important institutions of the conservative movement. If someone cynically said they could have played that role without having spent out and, and stuck went the perpetuity route, did did the fact that they had a explosive? It wasn't explosive though because it was over decades. But did the spend out decision increase its effectiveness over the long term, or are you just giving me good effects of its short term 
kind of infusion? That's that's a great question, and I suppose it's debatable. But 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 what um, what what is undoubtedly true is it had a much bigger effect on its time than it would have otherwise. And and of course, when you when when you can give a lot more, when you're not when you're not constantly protecting your endowment and only spending five percent. And, and kind of hoarding your resources because you have this, this goal of existing in perpetuity, you can take lots of chances. You can, you, can, you can take a chance on a group of law students who want to hold a conference in 1982 to talk about conservative legal ideas. Um, you know, it might be a flop. It might not matter. It might become the thing that becomes the Federalist Society too. So, so, and, and that's what winds up having a long-term effect. So, so Olin was not um, merely trying to affect his own time or, 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 or the period right after his, his death. He, he, he was maybe trying to have a kind of permanent effect on, on, on the United States. He just, said, he just said, you know, my foundation won't be here forever. Maybe some of the ideas it supports will be around for a long time. He would have liked that idea. John, could you comment, having just said that, in terms of sort of uh, strength or weakness with respect to people who have formed institutions, foundational institutions, uh, with respect to sort of what they want to do, not necessarily only spending out, but sort of how they want to pursue uh, ideas, what they want to pursue in terms of the content, uh, and therefore the idea of sort of spending out uh, would naturally be raised, and maybe a lot of people do that when they, they set up an institution such as a foundation. But uh, what I would like to get at a little bit is sort of the time value of money. It seemed to me Olin would be in a category of uh, individuals, not just in terms of his giving, but in terms of how he understood markets and the industry was in the time value of certain, you know, weighty and proper decisions based on evidence and all. But that uh, in your comments about in our first uh, episode on the strategic philanthropy, uh, do you think there may be a, a decline in that and a sort of a sort of uh, pushing of consumerism to the front with respect to the way money is given one in accumulating a lot of money because you don't undertake a sort of uh, a thorough understanding of what happens if you spend out and how it might help to spend out or n might not help and a sort of just let's gather the money together and sort of be a battleship in an era of drones uh, uh, could you just make a few comments on that the thing that persuaded olin to to sunset his foundation. Uh, th there were several factors, but the major thing was the example of the Ford Foundation, which by the 1960s and 1970s had become a thing that its benefactor would not have recognized and probably would not have supported. And there was, there was a very famous moment in the 70s when um, uh, I believe it was Henry Ford II quit the board of the Ford Foundation saying, saying this is not what the what 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 my family set out to do it had been captured by the left it had been captured by by board members who did not know the benefactor who did not share the same values and and wanted to take the ford foundation in a completely separate direction and and the thing is still around today uh arguably uh making mischief now uh olin saw this he said that's not, that's not going to happen with my foundation so this this was the number one reason he wanted to put in the, uh, the, the, the sunset provision. Uh, a, a lot of philanthropists have, have seen this example now and, and recognize its power. And, and they, they, they thought, I've amassed this fortune, I've created a foundation. Do I want it to be run a hundred years from now when I'm long gone by people I've never met? You know, a board of people who are not yet born, who are, who are unknown to me. Does that make sense? Um, uh, you know, they, they may not share my values, they may get captured by different interests. Um, you know, a, a lot of philanthropists have noticed this and, and have made their own rules about, about sunsetting. I, I serve on the board of the Apgar Foundation, which is a very small foundation compared to, to Olin and some of the, some of the heavyweights that, that we might discuss, but um, um, it has a sunset provision. And, and, and Martha Apgar, who is, who is the, the major donor who, who died uh, last year, last calendar year, um, um, said, I, I want you guys, the members of the board that is, to, to spend out this within a few years of my death. And, and so that's what, that's what we're doing. And this is, this is you know, one, so you can have greater force, two, so, so that you can remain true to the principles of the donor. You can maintain donor intent. 
Um, there, there are so many philanthropists now doing so many different things. Some of them are uh, inconstant in, in the ways you've just suggested that they, they um, um, you know, their interests will change from season to season and so will their giving, which I think probably reduces their effectiveness. You might make a big splash in one area and then, and then you know, your, your, your passions move into another, area, you do a new thing and, and you might have some effectiveness, you know, jumping around and so forth, but, but um, I think you have the most effectiveness when you kind of stick to good ideas and, and good people and invest in them over and over and over again. It's kind of like the stock market, right? You have a good stock, you just want to put more and more money into it. A good mutual fund, you stick with it. You know, it's like playing the stock market. Um, you know, good luck with that. Uh, you might have some success, but um, you also have some hits or misses and uh, you might be smarter over time just, just making some safer, you know, you can take some chances, but also making some safer bets consistently. So, so that's what the Olin Foundation uh, 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 tried, tried to do. And, and I think we still see its, its influence and success today. So I think this is a related question. Did the Olin Foundation ever do politics or allow itself to become politicized the way many philanthropies, some on the right perhaps, do? So John Olin, John M. Olin himself was a Republican who was a generous uh, donor to the Republican Party and to candidates. He was a personal friend of Richard Nixon. Um, Nixon, uh, uh, after he was president, showed up at a kind of uh, celebratory dinner when, when Olin was really you know, fully retiring from, from, from business. Um, so, so I can imagine you know, John M. Olin alive today going to... Um, you know, these different conferences of, of, of donors who want to win the next election and spending money on elections and so forth. This, though, is separate from his foundation activity. And the, the foundation, of course, there are a lot of rules about what foundations can do that inhibit election giving and so forth. But as you know, you can kind of monkey around with that and do, do kinds of giving that, that really are directed at elections and, and, and very quick political uh, effects and so forth. Um, the Olin Foundation never really did that. It was it was really playing a long game. It was trying to figure out how to win a battle of ideas. You know, again, not not how to how to win the next congressional election or the next presidential election, but but how are we going to secure an idea in the public mind and in, in in public policy over the next generation? And so it did this through investing in institutions. And, and also the people who ran them. I mean, they, they, you know, it's often said that philanthropy, you're, you're not investing in it's you're, you're always investing in people and, and finding great people who run good organizations and, and supporting them across the long haul, letting them do great work. Um, that's what the Olin Foundation did. And so its legacy is not that Ronald Reagan was elected president or George W. Bush or, or whatever you want to say. Its legacy is today there's a Federalist Society. Or today, there is a network of right of center student publications on major campuses around the country. Or uh, the, the law and economics is firmly established in, 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 in law schools around America. Uh, things like that, those are the legacies of, of the Olin Foundation, not, you know, not who voted how in whatever year. So is there another John M. Owen out there? It seems like it'd be difficult for that position to make it very far in, phil in philanthropy today. The pressures are so great to be short-term and politicized, I guess. Uh, and then if there, how would we find another John M. Owen, him or her? Well, it's easy to say there'll never be another John M. Owen Foundation. Of course, they all have their uniquenesses. And, and, and of course, every foundation, every philanthropist is gonna be uh, motivated by the, by the problems of his or her own time. And uh, even if you share principles with, with, with John and Mullen, you might, you might take a different kind of approach and so forth. Uh, I'll say, you know, Searle Freedom Trust has an awful lot of similarity with, with the Olin Foundation. Um, a couple of its key members, the executive director, also, also representation on the board, are, are, are people who, who grew up at the John M. Olin Foundation or, or, or helped run it. And, and um, the Searle Freedom Trust, which has, which has a different donor and which has, um, I don't want to say different purpose, but some different kinds of emphases on, on, on what it wants to do. It's very um, um, 
uh, public policy driven, um, um, interested in think tank support. Um, um, you know, and, and Olin Foundation is always the John and Olin Foundation did an awful lot of that. But but there, you know, there are some you know the, the flavoring is a little bit different. But 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 there's an awful lot in common. But the the, the, the Searle Freedom Trust will will spend out in the next few years. This was this was a a, a, a command of 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 Mr. Searle, its donor, who is deceased. Who essentially said, you know, you have a generation to, to, to or, or you know, not quite a gen, you know, I, th I think the, I forget the number of years, you you have, you have, you have, a, you have a time limit to to spend out the fortune that I'm going to leave behind. That's what they're doing, and and they're spending aggressively. They're spending wisely. They 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 follow a lot of the rules of the Olin Foundation of of continued support, and of of of, of organizations they think are um, uh, worthy, and. Uh, at the same time, they experiment with things. They try things, uh, discover things that work, things that don't. Um, they take a few chances, but but you know, the Soro Freedom Trust, I think, is a, is a kind of inheritor to the uh, to the John of Olin Foundation legacy. There there are a few others as well, and and the idea of sunsetting, I think, has an audience that that it didn't have uh, a generation ago, and and that's from philanthropists who've learned from the 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 old the John of Olin Foundation example uh this is still not um i don't know how mainstream an idea it is uh it's still probably a, a, a minority um view of a, a, a minority activity in in large foundations but but it's out there in a way that that everybody i'm sure is thinking about it and 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 a number are are, are doing it uh, uh wisely I, I i would wager does hillsdale have a hockey team hillsdale has a club hockey team yeah. Okay. So, so we're Hillsdale College is a, is a Division two NCAA school. Yeah. We have football, basketball, baseball, softball, volleyball, swimming, um, um, and some other sports. Um, uh, we don't have hockey. Uh, we did in the '70s, and briefly, the coach was Ted Lindsay, uh, the famous mm -hmm. Detroit Red Wing. He coached he coached uh, the team, and 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 occasionally run an alum, alumni who played for Ted Lindsay, um, wearing uh, you know Charger blue here at Hillsdale College. Uh, um, but, but, but sadly we don't have a, we don't have a varsity hockey team at the moment. Well, all right. I, you know, how's the football team going to do this year? You know, we, uh, uh, we'll see, uh, our football team <laughs> is competitive in, in the, uh, in, in, in the GMAC it's called the great Midwestern athletic conference. Uh, our basketball team last school year had a historically good year um for the program the volleyball team was very good uh what's what's great about our student athletes is number one they're they're really students you have to get admitted to hillsdale college based on your academic credentials and then you can go play sports and they're competitive in in division two sports um you know it's like any kind of college and any kind of team you have your up years and your down years um the football coach once here once told me um our longtime football coach, who I like a lot, I think is, is a very good coach. He once said, you know, I may not have the best football team, but I have the smartest football team in, in the conference because of because the kids have to come in on their on their academic credentials. And then they go out and compete. And uh, and, you know, sometimes they win the conference. Great. Well, John J. Miller, thank you so much for doing this uh, with us. Uh, My pleasure, guys. Thanks for all the work you do for uh, philanthropy and, and, and what you you know, what you've done throughout your careers and 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 you guys are, um, um, are are part of the reason, or maybe the 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 fault for my getting into this. You know, pursuing um, uh, looking at philanthropy as a journalist or a writer would look at it. But I, I appreciate all all that you guys have have done over the years on this. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, now we can. Uh, we'll stop. I'll stop. I'll hit stop.